On today's Murder She Wrote podcast, we find ourselves in jolly good old London, where we meet Jessica Fletcher's cousin, Miss Emma McGill. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Murder She Wrote podcast, where I l- watch every episode of the hit 80s 90s show, Murder She Wrote, starring three-time Academy Award nominee and five-time Tony Award winner, Miss Angela Lansbury. Today, I'm going to be talking about Season 2, Episode 5, Sing a Song of Murder, air date October 27th, 1985. Hopefully my uh, accent wasn't too che- cheesy. I try to do those little intros as a tribute to when Angela Lansbury says, Tonight on Murder, She Wrote. <sighs> this episode is one of my favorites because... Angela Lansbury not just gets to doesn't just get to play Jessica Fletcher, she gets to play her cousin Emma McGill as well. And she gets to sing one of her signature songs from her days at MGM, Goodbye Little Yellowbird, which she sung in the picture of Dorian Gray, where she got her second Oscar nomination after getting her first Oscar nomination in her first film, Gaslight. Um, And also, here's a little fun trivia fact before we get into this episode. Um, The name of McGill was actually Angela Lansbury's mother's maiden name. Her mother was an actress as well. And to pay tribute to her mother, writers, um, the writers of the show decided to use her mother's maiden name to pay tribute to her. So that's why Jessica Fletcher's maiden name is McGill. And in this episode, we get introduced to her cousin, Emma, who will make several guest appearances throughout the show. As always, if you are new to the Murder, She Wrote podcast and you have not watched the episode Sing a Song of Murder, please go watch it wherever it is that you watch your Murder, She Wrote episodes and then come back and listen to this episode because I'm going to spoil everything there is to spoil about this episode, the suspects, the murderer, why he or she did it, and everything in between. You can't have a Murder, She Wrote podcast without it, so, without doing it that way, so, from here on out, spoilers, because here we go. We start off this episode in London at the Mayhew Theatre. Now, this is not, this was shot on the Universal Backlot, you can totally tell, because, and how I know about the Universal Backlot is like, one day, I was playing around on YouTube and a video popped up in my recommendations to watch people go on the Universal tour, which I always heard about but never seen. And I've never gone like myself in person. I would love to someday, but I don't see it happening. I would like to someday, but yeah, I'm not a rich person. Um, So I don't see it happening. Um, So anyway, I watched the video and I learned so much, like, I had no idea that Desperate Housewives was filmed completely on the Universal backlot, Um, and Murder, She Wrote was filmed on the Universal backlot, so was Back to the Future, Gremlins, um, and so many other movies and TV shows, and they have different streets. They have streets that look like New York. They have streets that look like London. And how I know is because I remember seeing these streets in the video that I saw that they show in this episode. And they only show two different streets and not enough places to give us an idea that we're actually in London. Um, So I know this was not shot in London, unfortunately. We see a lot of stock footage um, from London to make it seem like we are in London, but we're not. Just something I observed. Um, so, and also, if I'm not mistaken, and I could be wrong about this, the theater that they're using, again, looks like the theater they used in season one in the Broadway episode with Luna Lunt. Um, and I'm blanking right now on the name. Um, I think it was like Broadway Melody or something, something with Broadway in the title. And um, the theater is also, I think, the same like movie theater 
that they used in Back to the Future and Gremlins, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. It looks like it is, but I can't confirm it. There's no trivia or anywhere to, to be absolutely positive, but just something I observed. So we find ourselves in this theater. There's not a lot of people there. Um, a man named Oliver Trenchable, um is doing sort of like stand-up comedy and he's not very successful. They're not laughing at his jokes and his daughter Kitty is watching from the wings and she's talking to someone and they're talking about apparently this offer that Mr. that a Mr. Briggs offered um she's talking to the director and um he's like do do you think her ladyship is going to um sell and she said are you are you crazy she'll probably outlive all of us and be singing that song until the end of time so Oliver finishes his set and he sees his daughter and he's so happy to see her. She's apparently back from college or somewhere. Um, and uh, he he's happy to see her and she, and she goes, it doesn't look like it went very well tonight. And he says, well, the audience, we don't have a, a very good audience. So then we get introduced to Emma McGill, played of course by Angela Lansbury. Um, she's wearing a red dress with a scarf and she has red hair and she sings goodbye little yellow bird I gladly mate with you it's an awesome song and while she's singing it we get introduced to Violet and her husband Archie Wims um, apparently Archie owns the theater and really wants to take Briggs's offer but Emma has a bigger holding stake in it or something and owns it more than he does. He's just co-owner and inherited it from his father who's dead now. Um, and apparently Violet is very greedy and so is Archie, but they don't really get to do much in this episode other than this scene. They're shown at the funeral and then they're completely dropped. Um, Violet tells Archie to talk to, to try to talk to Emma to try to get her to sell because they need the money and she wants the money. Emma finishes her song, the audience sings along with her, and then the curtain closes and the show is over. In her dressing room, we get introduced to her costume person, Bridget O'Hare, as well as her personal friend who tells her that she should take Mr. Briggs's offer and sell the theater and live her life while she still has the chance to do so. She says that that is her life and she wants to keep the theater and she knows that things will get, will perk back up because people still love going to the theater, which is true, they do. Unfortunately, with uh, COVID, we cannot go to the theater. I miss the theater. I used to do it in high school. Um, so anyway, we then find out that Oliver is dating um, Emma and they, he's waiting for to take her out to dinner. But Archie comes in and tries to convince her to sell. And again, she tells him the same thing she told Miss O'Hare, that, that this is her life and she doesn't want to sell the theater. She then goes out with Archie to get a pint of beer, her words. Um, when they're in an alleyway, a car comes swerving, comes barreling in and almost knocks her, but she's able to somehow grab a hold of something above the door and swing out of the way, which is obviously a stunt double because Angela Lansbury probably could not do that. Um, and Oliver asks her if she's okay and she says yes. Um, we then see her 
leaving her penthouse on a street that I've seen on the Universal backlot before. They try to make it look like it's London by putting the cars on the opposite side of the street, but you can totally tell. This was filmed in Hollywood at Universal Studios. But anyway, she gets into a car and then that's it. We then cut to Mrs. Fletcher's house where the world famous mystery writer is dusting her coffee table. <laughs> a Mr. Ernest Fleming calls her he is a representative of Mrs. McGill and says that she's had an untimely accident and she needs to come to London right away to settle her estate. Mrs. Fletcher hops on the next available pl plane and is there within minutes. There's a lot of stock footage of this airport, but I don't think we're actually in the airport that we see. Um, as soon as Miss Fletcher gets off of her plane, she's looking around for Mr. Fleming when Mr. Briggs comes up and introduces himself and says that he desperately wants Emma's theater and wants her to sell it to him. Mrs. Fletcher says, I don't know what you're talking about. I just got here and I haven't even talked to Mr. Fleming yet. I don't know what you're talking about. And he says, well, here's my card. Call me when you do. I want that theater, Mrs. Fletcher. I want it. So Mr. Fleming comes up and tells Mr. Briggs to shove off and that it's not going to happen. And he, and he says, I arranged for a limo to take us. Mrs. Fletcher wants to sit in the front seat with him so she can talk to him and get to know him. But he says, I insist you sit in the back. And she says, well, why? I want to sit up front with you. And then Emma reveals that she's alive and says, please, Jessica, I insist, please sit in the back with me. So Emma tells her on the way to a secluded townhouse that somebody has been trying to kill her in a series of accidents. One occurred outside the theater when she was almost hit by the car, which we saw. Another, um, a bra the brake line on her car had been cut and she noticed right away because she had to back she had to back out and someone was um, behind her and she couldn't stop. And then the third and final one, a heater blew up in her apartment. So she decided to fake her death by driving her car over a bridge. They go to a townhouse and that is your visual aid of them sitting on the couch talking to Mr. Fleming, wondering how they're going to solve who is trying to kill Emma. And it has to be somebody who wants the theater to be sold. Mr. Fleming says that he's arranged for Mrs. Fletcher to go to the funeral tomorrow to meet everyone at the theater. But Mrs. Fletcher insists upon involving her friend, Inspector Kyle, who she got introduced to in the, in the first episode of season one, Widow Weep For Me. But he's on holiday and so she decides to confide in his friend, Inspector Roger Crimmins. Mr. Crimmins decides to go along with her plan to scope out the would-be killer. The next day, everyone is having a funeral, mourning Emma with a, with a portrait painted of her. And when Mrs. Fletcher comes in, everyone is shocked. Violet and Archie have their last scene where they go, I hope she sells this place. Maybe we should go talk to her. No. No, we should leave her alone. Everyone is shocked with how much Jessica looks like Emma. And he and Fleming introduces her as Emma's American cousin and who's in charge of her estate. Inspector Cummings, Crummings comes and says, going along with the ruse, says that they have found Emma's body that has washed up on shore and Mrs. Fletcher, being the next of kin, has to go make the identification. But Mr. Fleming insists upon doing it himself. Before he leaves, Miss O'Hare says, Her ladyship said that I would be remembered. And he said, Yes, but this is not nor the time nor the place. Jessica then goes into Emma's dressing room and is going through her things to get some clues to who could be trying to hurt her. Miss O'Hare comes in and says, well, didn't take you long to take over, now did it? 
And Jessica says, I beg your pardon, Miss O'Hare. I don't know what you mean. And she says, well, you'd be probably taking all this back with her, won't you? Or taking this back with you, won't you? And uh, she says, no, I, I'm just here to figure out what happened. She said, I know that Emma loved you very much, Miss O'Hare. And she phoned me a couple days ago and told me about a series of accidents. And I think they might have led to her death. And she said, well, I know all about her more than you do. I know all about that stuff. Even when she's not talking to me about it, I knew about it. And I intend to get what's mine, whether you want me to or not. And she gets angry and she leaves. Ms. Fletcher then explores the theater and runs into Oliver and his daughter Kitty, who are leaving. They have an appointment to go have an audition for a Shakespearean play. Um, Kitty is insistent that her father go, but he wants to stop and talk to Jessica, who he can't believe looks so much like Emma. He tells her how much he loved Emma and how the two of them were companions, dating, and that he was sad to see of her passing. And he can't believe how much Jessica looks like her. Um, Kitty keeps insisting that they go, and finally he goes off and goes. Later that night, Jessica and the inspector go to a restaurant to have dinner, and Jessica wonders if they're being discreet enough, if anyone in the theater knows about Emma being alive, and he says no. They go to go back to the flat where Emma is, and she says, I'm so sorry, Inspector. I phoned. I phoned my townhouse to tell Archie that I was okay. I, I didn't tell him where I was. I had to. I adore the man. And he goes, Do you realize what you could have done? So Mrs. Fletcher insists upon going to Emma's townhouse to look around and maybe they can erase the message before anyone hears it. Well, they go to her townhouse and someone is leaving the townhouse dressed in her leopard coat. Upon from, for, from far away, it looks like it is Emma. And Jessica's like, well, why would she go there? And how did she beat us there? But it turns out that it's not Emma. It's actually Miss Bridget O'Hara who has died. The coat, Emma had promised her the coat and she can't believe that she's dead now. But she says, I swear that Oliver would not have killed her and would not be killing me. And Jessica says, are you sure? Are you absolutely sure? So they go to Oliver's apartment and they realize that he is a, he used to be a very accomplished Shakespearean actor because there's lots of posters on the wall with his name on them. And um, they play the messages on his machine. There's one for the audition that he was going to the previous day. And then saying that he was going to, that he could maybe meet him in the hotel lobby. Um, and then there's the episode from Emma saying that she's okay, but she can't say anything more. So later that same day, Oliver is auditioning for Henry VIII and he's doing really good. He's getting all the lines, he's reaching a fever pitch and he forgets the text. And I can sympathize with him. In high school, I did theater and I was in a Shakespeare play, A Midsummer's Night's Dream. I played Snug the Joiner. Um, I was the actor in a play within the play Midsummer's Night's Dream. The lovers 
which A Midsummer Night's Dream is about people who fall in love with the wrong person due to potions and different things. What fools these mortals be? That That's where that comes from. And they all decide to attend our performance of a play. And I play, played Snug the actor who ends up playing a lion because I had to wear a lion's head and everything. And I had this four page monologue where I had to explain to the metaphorical audience that was coming to view our play within Midsummer's Night's Dream that I'm an actor on stage playing a lion. I'm not actually a lion and I'm not, and if I scare you at all, you know, I'm sorry, please take pity on my life. And this went on for four pages and it took me forever to memorize that and when you're doing Shakespeare, you have to like talk, 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 and you have to keep going and you have to make sure the audience understands what you're saying. So I remember we did this matinee in the afternoon. The audience was like not getting any of the jokes. They were completely and utterly quiet. And I had to do my monologue and I'm reaching a fever pitch. You know, I'm I'm really selling it. I'm wearing that lion head. I was hot under that lion head. And suddenly the, the dreaded thing happens. I cough. And that is like the worst thing that can happen to you as an actor is you cough because you're focused on that and you're trying to get yourself to stop. And then suddenly the lines just went out of my head. I couldn't remember where I left off. So I had to start all over again. And this angered the people that was supposed to come on behind me. Um, especially this one girl who was really into Shakespeare and was kind of like the Sheldon, the female version of Sheldon from Big Bang Theory. Um, she was really mad because after my monologue, she's supposed to come on stage. Um, so I had to start again. I had to redo my monologue and finally finished and went on the side of the stage. And they don't realize that they're on the side of the stage of, or this, they're on the stage where we're performing the play within the play. And I'm supposed to jump out when she says a specific line and go roar. Well, she didn't say her line to get back at me for messing up her entrance or whatever. So I'm waiting for her to say her line and she's not, and suddenly it's quiet. They have, they have gone off to the side of the stage. And so thinking, okay, she must have said it. That's why. So then I, so then I jump up and yell roar, but they're not there to catch me because they were supposed to catch me. And so I jump up two feet up on the, the stage. And since there's no one there to catch me, I fall flat on my stomach. The audience laughs and applauds. And I got the only laugh and applause that day. And it was a mistake. And then I got ridiculed for it backstage because how can I mess up my monologue, blah, blah. But yes, in conclusion, Shakespeare is hard. So I sympathize with Oliver and I miss being in the theater. There's not a lot of opportunities right now because of COVID, but even before COVID, there's not a lot of opportunities to do theater where I live, but I miss doing theater. It was so much fun. So I appreciate Oliver's struggle here because Shakespeare is hard to learn, hard to understand. It's it's probably the most difficult thing you'd have to do as an actor is being a Shakespeare Shakespearean play. And although not to say that they're not brilliantly written, they're wonderful, and I and I love Romeo and Juliet and all his works, but it is hard to do Shakespeare. It is hard to do Shakespeare, and it is hard to do musicals sometimes. Um, so Oliver is doing a really good job here. I mean, if I was the director, I would hire him on the spot. He clearly knows the material, but forgot it just a little bit. But the director gets angry and decides not to cast him and says that he's a has-been and, and, 
and he ends up going off on this guy saying Shakespearean text as he's doing it. And Mrs. Fletcher comes in at this point and he gets embarrassed because she's watching and and he apologizes and says, I'm so sorry that you had to witness, you know, my outburst like that. And she said, well, the fault wasn't with you. He clearly, you were doing a good job. He clearly didn't know what he had, which is true. So they go to a restaurant and Mrs. Fletcher decides to tell Pat, uh, Oliver, sorry, um, that he, that Emma is alive and well, but she's not going to tell him where she is. And um, he's surprised when he goes, she's alive. And Kitty goes, is this some kind of joke? And Mrs. Fletcher says, no, um, she's alive. And I'm solving who's been trying to kill her. And she said, but Oliver, I'm surprised that you're surprised because she left a message on your machine. And you were at the hotel lobby because you got the message about the audition. So you couldn't have heard one message without hearing the other. And then suddenly the inspector appears and says, my sentiments exactly, Mrs. Fletcher. Oliver Trenchbull, you are under arrest for the murder of Bridget O'Hare. So then something random happens, which I still don't understand. I've watched this episode twice and I still don't understand it. Mr. Briggs somehow finds out where Emma is. I don't know how. And he knocks on the door and pretends to be Inspector Crimmins. And when she opens it, he's like, you need to sign this right now. I have way too many people. I, I, uh, I have no way too many powerful people that want this to happen and blah, blah, blah. And you need to sign it right now. And he acts like he's going to kill her. He's like, he's gone batshit crazy. And this is his only second scene in the episode. And we don't see enough of him to know what is going on and why this cell is so important to him. So Jessica and the inspector decide to go see Emma to tell her that Oliver has been arrested and has been cleared because his alibi is checked out. He was in the hotel lobby waiting for the director to give him an audition. Um, cause since he hasn't acted in a long time, he has to like beg for jobs, I guess. And when they knock on the door, um, Emma hits Mr. Briggs with a plant and says, look, we found our killer. And Mrs. Fletcher says, no, I'm afraid we have not. She says, well, I know it's not Oliver. And Mrs. Fletcher says, no. It isn't Oliver, and it isn't, and it isn't Mr. Briggs either. I know exactly who it is. We we need to get to the theater. So they go. She goes to the theater. Oliver has been let go. His alibi has checked out. Kitty comes, and she's like, "Oh, Dad, I'm so happy that you're that you're okay, and they let you go." Mrs. Fletcher then turns and says, I've been thinking about the accidents that Emma had. They happened on consecutive weekends by someone who doesn't live in town. And Oliver says, oh, you can't be suggesting that it's my daughter. And she says, oh, but it is. She said, you said that you phoned the hotel at eight o'clock and knew that your father was there, but how did you know he was there? The only way you could have known is if you heard the message on the machine. And if you heard the message of where he was, then you heard Emma's message too. And you thought you saw Emma outside of her penthouse and you ran down Bridget O'Hare instead. Bridget was going to get Emma's coat that she felt she was entitled to. And you killed her. At first, she denies it, but then eventually, she says, all right, I did, and Oliver says, why? She said, I did it for you, Dad. You're, you're so talented, and you prostituted yourself to be in this god-awful theater for that woman. Why? Because you love her. You're so good. You're so brilliant. 
and she was draining the talent right out of you. It isn't fair. She had to die so that you can have a better career. And she starts to cry and she says, but I wouldn't have let them arrest you for murder. If it had gone that far, I would have told them about it. And I would have let, got you off. I'm so sorry, daddy. And that's where the episode ends. We don't know if Emma keeps the theater. Um, if Mr. Briggs is arrested for attempt assault. Um, or anything in between. Um, this was a really great episode. Angela Lansbury gives an Emmy award winning performance as both Jessica and Emma. Um, and Emma will make several other appearances in other episodes of Murder, She Wrote. I don't know exactly how many. Um, so the only thing is that I don't understand why Kitty had to kill Emma for her father to have a good career. If she had just expressed to him how she felt, it would have been, he would have understood and he would have been like, okay, I'll audition more, but you know, it's his life. He should be able to do whatever he wants. So not a very good would-be killer for season two. Um, let's go over our guest stars here. We have Sarah Douglas as Violet, um, who did not get a lot to do in this episode, but let's see what she's been in. She's known for the first Superman and the second Superman, and V, the final battle, and Conan, the destroyer. She's still alive, and her last known credit is from 2019, A Christmas Prince, the Royal Baby. She's She's been in 89 different things. Um, she's done voiceover work for uh, video games from Doctor Who, Batman Beyond, Superman the Animated Series, um, Babylon 5, um, Father Downing Mysteries, This is her only episode of Murder, She Wrote. She was on Falcon Crest. Um, so good for her. She's still acting. You go. She apparently played the villain in the first two Superman films. And the only guest star I recognized was Olivia Hussey, who played our attempted murder -er. She is, of course, known for Romeo and Juliet, Black Christmas, the original Black Christmas from 1974, Death on the Nile, and Lost Horizon. And Death on the Nile, um, in 1978, had Angela Lansbury in it. She's still alive and still acting to this day. Um, she's in pre-production for something called 1066 and One Week in Hollywood. Um, she's done some voiceover work for video games for Star Wars. She's done some voiceover work in Pinky and the Brain, one of my favorite uh, shows growing up as a kid. She was in the miniseries Lonesome Dove. She, pulled, she was in the original miniseries of Stephen King's It, which I own that book and I have not finished reading it yet after all these years. This is her only episode of... Uh, Murder, She Wrote. How sad. It would have been awesome to see her in others. And she was in the miniseries The Last Days of Pompeii. Awesome, fascinating story. So, she's a really great actress. I rather enjoyed her. Um, our inspector was played by Bernie Ingram. I know, I did not say that right, I'm sorry. He died in 2015 at the age of 82. He is known for The Great Mouse Detective, The Day of the Jackal, A Challenge for Robin Hood, and Doctor Who, the TV show. He was in 107 different things. 
His last known credit is a miniseries called The Triangle in 2005. Um, he was in Jekyll and Hyde the Musical. Um, and he'll appear in another episode of Murder, She Wrote. Um, and then I'll do more of his credits then when we get to that episode. Um, Gladys Johns played Bridget O'Hare, our unfortunate victim that did not deserve to die. She's known for Mary Poppins, While You Were Sleeping, The Reef, and The Court Jouster, which had Angela Lansbury in it. Her last known credit is Superstar as the Grandma. And this is her only episode of Murder, She Wrote. She also guest starred on Love Boat, Cheers. Oh, as Diane's mother. I knew she looked familiar. And she played the mother on Mary Poppins. So that's where I knew her from. You know, our daughter's daughters will adore us and we'll sing in grateful chorus. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Oliver was played by Patrick Mc McKee. He died in 2015 at the age of 93. He's known for A View to Kill, James Bond movie. The Avengers television show in 1961, the the Howling, and Battlestar Galactica, the original 1978 show. His last known credit is 2003's The Low Budget Time Machine. He was in 175 different things. Family Law, that was a good movie, or good show. Thunder in Paradise, um, Coach. And he'll appear in another episode of Murder, She Wrote, so we'll go over more of his credentials when we get to that episode. Um, Mr. Briggs was played by Gregory Paul Martin. Who is known for Memoirs of the Invisible Man, A Walk in the Clouds, Strange. He's more known for writing stuff. Um... As an actor, he's only been in 18 different things. His last known credit is Lily's Light, the movie in 2020 as professor, as a professor. He was in television show Sliders, Ellen, Babylon 5, Mad About You, Empty Nest, um, Ring Riders, The Real Ghostbusters cartoon series. This is his only episode of Murder, She Wrote. Interesting. Um, Mr. Fleming was played by Christoph Tabloom Blee, uh, I, and I think he played our murderer in We're Off to Kill the Wizard, if I'm not mistaken. He's known for Star Wars, um, After School Special as a director, and Murder, She Baked as, as a director. Um, he's done a lot of voiceover work. Yep, he played he played the murderer in We're Off to Kill the Wizard. I and he will appear in a couple of other episodes of Murder She Wrote. So we'll go over more of his uh, credentials then. And Archie was played by Kenneth Danzer. Oh, I know I did not say that right. He's known for Stargate movie, The Holiday, 101 Dalmatians, and Shrek as crew. Um, his last known credit as an actor is Moonraker, the radio play. I don't know. Um, he was in Garfield, A Tale of Two Kitties, A Boyfriend for Christmas, Quest for Camelot, ER, Melrose Place, um, Married with Children, and he'll appear in another episode of Murder, She Wrote, so we will um, go over more of his credentials when we get there. 
And that's all our guest stars. Didn't have a lot of recognizable guest stars in this episode, but like I said, the highlight was seeing um, Angela Lansbury sing Goodbye Little Yellowbird, which she sung in the picture of Dorian Gray. It's really an awesome episode, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, as I hope you did. Um, I will see you guys in the next one. Happy crime subbing. Hope everyone is being safe out there. It was really cold today. We had like an ice storm and everything, and, and uh, it's really cold today. Um, but anyway, have a good day, night, depending on whenever you listen to this. And I'll see you in the next one, and happy crime solving!